Much to do has been made over the U.S. Army General of World War II, George S. Patton. Well, this story isn't about him. This one's about Charlie Patton, a humble Mississippi Delta Blue singer who died in 1934. The only thing this Patton had in common with the renowned general was that his name, too, was Patton. Charlie Patton lived most of his life on the vast Dockery Plantation in the bottomlands of the Mississippi Delta. He was a rambler, a shiftless, no good, who lived off women and passed his time in total idleness. He was also a great blues performer whose powerful effect on the blues and rock and roll is still felt today, though few people ever heard of him. The music he played and sang can in no way be described. It must be listened to. Most of the time, Charlie worked alone, at parties and juke joints on the plantation, or in nearby towns. He was a popular entertainer with the field hands, with his dynamic driving dance rhythms, his theatrics, clowning, and stunts like playing the guitar behind his back. When the good times were ready to roll back in the quarter, Charlie was the man they wanted. For the poor, isolated black people who lived and worked on these plantations, it was a way of life little different from the days of slavery. But every farm and every town had its musicians. There were songsters and guitar players, fiddlers and banjo pickers. The blues was a new style of playing when Charlie, as a teenager, first learned it from an older musician at Dockery's in the early 1900s. His name was Henry Sloan. Henry Sloan may well have been the early bluesman that W.C. Handy heard while waiting for a train in Tutwiler, Mississippi in 1903. Handy was a successful schooled musician who was so inspired by the music of the unknown blues singer that he went on to write the St. Louis Blues, the Yellow Dog Blues, Memphis Blues, and many other popular tunes using the blues form. The new commercialized blues were sung in theaters and cabarets by refined black women entertainers backed by the jazz bands then emerging on the showbiz scene. This Tin Pan Alley Blues barely touched the remote, rural, black people of the Delta region, where the real down-to-earth blues continued to evolve as an intense and eloquent expression of their lives. And they all came to learn from Charlie Patton. He was recognized as the hottest blues player by other positions, as well as by the crowds he played for. Son House, Howlin' Wolf, Tommy Johnson, and other great blues singers came to listen and learn from Patton. Some of them went right on to become legends in their own right. Fortunately for us, Patton and some of the others were approached by commercial record company scouts in the late 20s to make records. The musicians were paid to travel to northern cities to record or brought to temporary studios set up in local hotels. The record companies recorded these regional blue singers in the hopes of selling phonograph machines to black people. With the oncoming Great Depression, poor people stopped buying record players altogether. What was left of the recording industry lost interest in rural musicians and stayed with the more professional urban bluesmen, like Washboard Sam, Tampa Red, and Big Bill Brunzi. But the extensive recording of country blues in the 20s has left us with a rich cultural heritage. Fortunately, most of the rare old 78s have been reissued by collectors on small labels so that we can still enjoy this great music today. Almost all the enthusiasm for Patton's music now comes from white, upper middle class aficionados and a few rock musicians. All the research on his life 
has been done by white academics, it seems the old blues is still too vivid a reminder to black people of an oppressive Uncle Tom past they'd rather forget about. If he were still alive, Charlie would surely consider all this fuss bitterly ironic. In his time, no white people listened to the raw kind of blues he played. In fact, Charlie had very little contact with whites at all. Even respectable church-going blacks considered him and his kind as bad niggers, and the blues was looked on as the devil's music. Patton's father was a hard-working farmer and a devout Christian. He was not pleased when he found out that his young son was playing that sinful music. When stern warnings failed, Charlie was taken to the woodshed for a harsher taste of Christian justice. Later, his father's heart softened toward the wayward son, and he bought Charlie a guitar. In these early days, he was playing around the neighborhood with the Chapman family, a string band group that played ragtime, minstrel, and tin pan alley tunes at social affairs, picnics, and parties. But even this music was too tame for the intense, seething young Patton. He was irresistibly drawn to the more passionate and less white music of Henry Sloan with its more complex rhythms. Charlie was under the spell of the blues and followed Henry Sloan around for years, trying to grasp the rudiments of this new musical approach. His family never saw him much anymore. He wandered about, picking up the ways of midnight ramblers, drinking heavily, and living off women who cooked in white people's kitchens. When things went bad, he would repent and take up the Bible and resolve henceforth to put his life in the service of the Lord by preaching the gospel. These conversions never lasted long. Charlie couldn't stay away from the loose women, the good times, and the moonshine liquor. Patton was known for being high-tempered, flighty, and for having a big mouth, which often got him into fights, though he was ill-equipped to defend himself physically. Sometime around 1931, someone tried to cut his throat, but Patton survived with an ugly scar. It is also well known that he fought violently with his women. If those women made him mad, he'd just fight and, you know, knock him out with that old guitar, claimed an old acquaintance. I knew one of his wives named Lizzie, and she said one day he just walked off with his guitar and never came back. She hadn't done nothing to him. He hadn't done nothing to her. Well, after that, she would talk a lot about how mean he was. But she kept his picture right there on her mantle. She kept it till the day he died. Most of the blues recorded at his first sessions in 1929 were celebrations of the wild times, boasts of his sexual adventures, jealous women, two-time on women, drinking and carousing. In It Won't Be Long, Patton sings, got a long, tall woman, tall like a cherry tree. She gets up for a day and she put the thing on me. In Tom Russian Blues, he sings about getting drunk and thrown in jail. I lay down last night, hoping I would have my peace. But when I woke up, Tom Russian was shaking me. When you get in trouble, no use to screaming and crying. Tom Russian will take you back to prison house flying. One of Patton's most popular records, High Water Everywhere, was a wailing lament about the Mississippi River flood of 1927. The great river overflowed the levees and washed over the land. Backwater done rose at summer, drove poor Charlie down the line. Lord, I tell the world, the water done jumped through this town. It was 50 men and children come to sink and drown. Oh, Lordy, women and grown men down. Oh, women and children sinking down. 
I couldn't see nobody home and wasn't nobody to be found. Several of his songs were about moving on, leaving a woman, wandering. I'm going away, sweet mama. Don't you want to go? Take God to tell when I'll be back here anymore. Mostly he sang about having a good time. I like to fuss and fight. I like to fuss and fight. Lord, and get sloppy drunk off a bottle and ball and walk the streets all night. But the words were not the main point of Patton's music. They are barely understandable most of the time and impossible sometimes. Even Sun House has said that Charlie's words were difficult to make out. Charlie was playing dance music mostly for Saturday night parties where there was a lot of noise and carrying on and potent corn liquor flowed freely. His voice was used as a musical instrument. He shouted, screamed, bellowed and growled. He beat on his guitar, pounding out heavy rhythms for long stretches, sometimes half an hour while the crowd danced. Hayes McMullen, a contemporary of Patton's, remembers, I've seen Charlie Patton just bump on his guitar instead of picking it. Colored folks get dancing, gonna dance all night, so I'd let them get good and started, you know. I'd be hollering, and then I'd just be knocking on the box when the music get going. Patton's best friend seems to have been Willie Brown. They sometimes played together for dances, Willie filling in the rhythm while Charlie threw his guitar up in the air, caught it between his legs, and ran through his other tricks to amuse the crowd. Tommy Johnson also came to learn from these two great blues masters. Back home, he told his brother Liddell that he had learned the blues by selling his soul to the devil. He said, a big black man will walk up there and take your guitar and he'll tune it and then he'll play a piece and hand it back to you. That's the way I learned how to play anything I want. Another great Delta singer who came to know Charlie Patton was Sun House. Patton invited him to come along to a recording session in Grafton, Wisconsin with himself and Willie Brown. Also going along was Louise Johnson, a young girl who played a powerful boogie-woogie piano blues in a local juke joint. Patton was impressed with her playing as well as her looks and had begun courting her. House bragged years later how he'd stolen the girl piano player away from Charlie on the trip up to Grafton. I say, I really kind of like you, gal, and we take another big swallow. So they have a little hotel there in Grafton where the recorders stay at. Louis says, I got me and your key. I say, oh, and that's the way it happened. By the mid-twenties, a younger crop of blues players were coming up strong in the Delta. Among these was a high-strung teenager named Robert Johnson. The older musicians disdained young Johnson's faltering efforts on the guitar. When they were drunk and feeling mean, Patton, Brown, and House would often ridicule Johnson's playing, finally forcing him to run away from the area. A year or so later, Robert Johnson returned and dazzled them all with a new blues guitar style that he had created on his own. In 1936 and 37, Johnson would record some of the greatest country blues of all time. Patton's health was seriously failing by 1930. His songs began taking on a more ominous, desperate note. Oh, I remember one morning, standing in my baby's door. Boy, you know what she told me? Looky here, Papa Charlie, I don't want you no more. From 1930 on, Patton lived with a woman named Bertha Lee, who cooked for white families in the neighborhood. The couple moved around, had violent arguments. Patton blamed his failing health on her. He accused her of starving him. They'd get drunk and go at each other in violent fits of rage. But they stayed together and sang. Together at Patton's last recording session in 1934, in January of that year, W.R. Calloway of the American Record Corporation began looking for Patton to cut some new records. 
the industry was beginning to revive somewhat from the depression. He finally located Charlie and Bertha Lee in the little town of Belzoni, Mississippi. They were both in jail, having been involved in a drunken fracas at a house party. Calloway bailed them out. He took them with him back to New York City. Patton was in very bad shape. He was weak, short of breath, and had lost much of his performing power. His last recordings reveal his awareness that his life may be cut short. In Poor Me, he sings, Don't the moon look pretty, shining down through the tree. I can see Bertha Lee, Lord, but she can't see me. He and Bertha Lee sang together on the song, O oh Death. On this record, you can vividly hear the nearness of death and Charlie's horror in the face of it. Several weeks after this, Patton lay on his deathbed. For a week he laid there, preaching, repeating over and over his favorite sermon, recorded by him in 1929 under the pseudonym Elder J.J. Hadley. Well, friend, I'm going to tell you, you tell me when it comes down, his hand going to be like lamb wool, and his eye like flame of fire, and every man going to know he's a son of two living God. Round his shoulder going to be a rainbow, and it see like fine bread. And my friend, I won't let you know again, he said, they're going to have a river water that flows through the garden, clear the creature, and go have a tree that's 4 to 12 mountains of food, and the lean going to be Peter Gerald Nation, and a big rock that you can set by, and the wind can't blow on you no more. And you're going to have the four and 20 others that you can sit down and talk with, and that you talk about your soul that you come from, the world that you just come from. He's going to sing a little sign of Charlie Patton died on April 28th, 1934. His death went unreported by the local and national press. I will point to all the men, King Jesus is it. Well, I got it, I had to go up. Don't you need somebody when you come to die? Don't you need somebody when you come to die? I will...